Hey guys, I'm Jared from Shaping the Silence, and today I'm going to give you an overview of the machine that is bringing my dreams to life. This is it. This is my baby, my beautiful 3D printer. I've put a lot of work into this. This printer relies on a process called fused filament fabrication in which one layer of plastic is put on top of the next and the next and the next until you get the final product. You can see this process exemplified here in which you've got all these different layers making up the whole object. Now this one started printing this way from the bottom, it made one layer, moved up, made another, and a few hundred layers later, you end up with this object. In order for this system to work, you need to have four main elements. So we have first the extruder, which pulls plastic off of a spool and pushes it down this tube, which goes down to the hot end, which heats up the plastic and pushes it out the end. The next thing you need is a movement system right here. In my case, it is a delta system, which uses three axes to move the head all over the print bed. And then you need to have a print surface. In this instance, I have this um, hot plate, which heats up so that the plastic can stick well, and then cools down when the print is done so the plastic can release. As you can clearly see, this build is held together with a lot of love, a lot of zip ties, and even some duct tape. 3D printed parts I used in here are from various different printer designs, and some things were just kind of slapped on willy-nilly, and it worked. This extruder design is from the Ultimate Greg's Wade Geared Extruder Bowden version that I found on Thingiverse. The reason I went with it being geared down so much is because I need to push a lot of this thick filament um, through in order to print quickly because this printer goes through plastic very quickly due to the large hot end and nozzle I have down here. And here we have the print head which is made up of several elements. Hey buddy, do you need some attention? The movement system on this printer is based off a design called Rostock by Johan, as you can see. Here is his original prototype of that design. I took a lot of the elements from it, such as um, these things on the sides, um, some of the carriage elements, the motor mounts, and things like that in order to make this happen. I ended up scaling the design up by having longer rods here um, for the head, and then I have these custom elements around the side. These were designed by my brother, and these all make the frame here, which then holds these floorboards, um, which I'm using as the frame. The reason why I went with these bamboo floorboard scraps is because they're very stiff, and also because they just happened to be sitting around when I was working on this. Now let's flip this thing over and get to the brains of this whole system. All right, here's the underside of the printer. It has the control board, the heated bed heater thing, the three motors, and the power supply. First off, the power supply is a 12 volt, 30 amp power supply, which I have over volted to about 14 and a half volts by twisting this little potentiometer here. Uh, that does a very good job at keeping the heated bed very hot while it's printing and moving the motors quite well. The reason why I chose this instead of the typical ramps board is because I wanted a much faster processor to run the movement system. The Delta movement system typically requires some extra math and so to make that processing smooth I went with this board. Hit smooth smoothie board. Okay. I have a separate board here for turning on and off the heated bed. The reason for that is because the heated bed that I have is quite large and requires a huge amount of current to run. So that's why I have that separate board there. Four motor drivers here. Three of them connect to the movement motors here and the fourth one connects to the extruder motor. It also has some heater um, plugs right here 
These connect to the heater on the hot end side, which melts the plastic. And then it also controls whether or not the hot bed is on or off. It also takes in these temperature sensing leads, which then gives it the temperatures on the heat bed and the hot end so that it can keep track of that and keep from burning the house down. And it has some wires coming in from these switches that go to the top so that way it can sense when these parts have hit the top. Outside of all of this, I have this little computer here, which does the job of sending all the print commands to the printer. So if I want to move the printer or preheat it or even launch a print job from here, I can just select one of these and tell it to start printing right there. Now the reason why I have this is so that I don't have to plug a computer in and keep it awake the whole time while I'm doing like a 20 hour print. I can just keep this little board plugged in and I don't have to think about that. Throughout the life of this printer, I've had many problems with it. The biggest being the nozzle clogging. To explain why I was having that issue and how I fixed it, I'm gonna have to get some parts out to show you. The typical hot end is made up of four parts. So you have the cold zone, which is this heat sink. You have the heat break, which is this piece of metal, which connects the cold zone to the um, heater block. The heater block here and the nozzle. Now this nozzle is much bigger than the heater block because it's designed for a bigger heater block like the one I currently have on my printer. Well, let's continue. So the heater block has two slots in it. You have one hole here for the heater cartridge and a little hole here for the temperature sensor, kind of like what we have on this guy right here. So the reason why we have these different elements is to keep the filament from melting too early and you know have it melt at just the right point. So the problem I was having with my, with my filament getting clogged was um, it would melt in this area right here in the cold zone. So the filament would get a little bit soft and then it would bunch up and then get stuck in here. Now the reason why this was happening is because my heat breaks are not that great. I'm using a knockoff of, what, of the E3D V6, which is one of the more popular designs for a hot end. Um, the, Official ones are made using very well machined parts which have a very thin wall for this heat break. So right between the cold zone and the hot zone, there's a thin piece of metal. Here it's a bit thicker because it's not as precisely made, which means more heat is transferred from the hot zone to the cold zone. And this heat sink could not keep up with that. So in order to fix that, I, um, I worked on putting some tube in here that actually insulated the filament from the, um, from the heat until it reached the nozzle itself. Here's an example. I have this little tube here inside the heat break and this insulates the plastic going through it from melting as easily. This is what your typical hot end will look like. The cold zone, the heat break, and the melt zone there with the nozzle coming out. Another problem I had while printing was parts that were on here would become unstuck while printing and thus they would slide around and it would just turn into a big ball of spaghetti rather than an actual part. In order to fix this problem, I had to do several things. First and foremost was getting this heated bed going. Um, I needed to get the temperature on the heated bed hot enough. In order to do that, I had to turn up the voltage of the power supply like I mentioned earlier. But that wasn't enough. I also needed to get the plastic to stick to the surface, and I found that there is a certain type of plastic called PEI, I believe that stands for polyethamoride, and I have that glued onto the surface of this glass bed here. Now that plastic surface, when heated up, becomes very sticky to the printable plastics and makes it stick quite well. But even that was not quite enough to fix my issue because this surface is a little bit uneven and the printer assumes that it's printing flat. So in order to fix that, I had to use some calibration techniques to accommodate for any warping in the bed. In order to calibrate this properly, I had to use this. Now this right here is a pressure sensitive um, device and I can just connect this to the nozzle of my printer. Now, when this is on here, 
I run a software calibration feature which then moves this head around and pokes the bed at points all over the place, generating a height map of the entire bed. From there, it can use that height map to figure out how to print flat on the whole surface, even though it's a little bit uneven. Once the thing is done running a calibration, I can just remove this and put it off to the side. I don't have to worry about doing that very often. I only have to do it if I move this thing around a whole bunch. I made a post a few weeks ago on Facebook, Discord, and Instagram uh, asking you if you had any questions about this 3D printer and the things that go on with it. So, I've got some answers for you, alright? First question I got was, how did I design this thing in order to make large prints? Well, um, the way I did that was first by making a large frame. You know, as you can see, it has a large movement area and has a reasonably large bed down there. But the biggest thing in terms of turning it into a large format printer is the heater block size and the nozzle size. For this printer, I used what's called a volcano hot end, which is a standard hot end, but it has a much taller heater block. Um, the reason why this is important is because it gives the filament enough time to, to melt even if it's being pushed through at a fast speed. The next part that makes the large format possible is the nozzle size. Now, typically in a 3D printer, you have a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, which is fine for general printing. Now, in my printer, I use a 0.8 millimeter nozzle most of the time. I can even step it up to a one millimeter or 1.2 millimeter nozzle. And having that size allows me to make much larger prints much faster because it can push out multiple times the volume of plastic as a standard 0.4 millimeter nozzle, laying down plastic in thick lines that get done really fast and really strong. Now, another question I've gotten is about the types of plastics I can use in this printer. Um, currently, I usually print using PLA, which is a corn-based sort of plastic. I use that because it's easier to print with than most other plastics. It doesn't warp um, depending on the heat. A problem with 3D printing oftentimes is the plastic, you know, heats up and then cools down. And the problem with different types of plastics is some of them shrink more when they cool down. Uh, PLA has fewer problems with that than most plastics. ABS is another plastic I use that has a lot more of the warping problem, but it is um, less ten temperature sensitive. So if you leave a PLA print out in a hot car, it's going to get soft. If you leave an ABS print out in a hot car, it's not. Um, so if you need something in a temperature sensitive application, ABS is a much better way to go there. I've been asked if I can do things with like polycarbonate and other types of plastics like that. Unfortunately, with my setup with the PTFE tube um, in my heat break, which keeps the filament from melting early, I can't use high temperature filaments because I can only push the temperature up to a certain level. And so that kind of restricts me to um, PLA, um, ABS, PETG, um, plastics that are much lower temperature. Than, than those really tough plastics like um, the polycarbonate and things like that. Now another question I've gotten, which kind of relates to those filament types, is what does it smell like when I'm printing? Well, it's largely dependent on the type of plastic I'm printing with. So with PLA, the plastic I most often use, it kind of has a sweet smell to it. It's almost like a corn syrup sort of smell to it. I, I guess that's kind of what the plastic is based off of. Um, so it, it has that sort of a smell to it. When I print with ABS though, it's a much more bad smell. I, I don't know how to describe it except like, you know, burning plastic, that kind of smell. That's the kind of smell you get out of the printer. It's not super, super strong, but if you're sitting in the same room with it as it's printing, it's going to hurt. You're, you're not going to want to breathe that in. It's probably toxic. And if you're stuck in a small room with it, it's going to make your eyes hurt a little bit and stuff like that. So you gotta make sure you have ventilation when you're running plastics other than PLA. Even PLA, you should probably have some ventilation, but it, it's not as important. If I was to go with any other type of plastic, like a polycarbonate, that's going to have a very, very bad smell. Um, I've heard, heard about that being a particularly nauseous fume when it comes to printing. 
So, um, you know, when, when it comes to that, if I ever end up printing that kind of plastic, I'm going to make sure that I have a direct ventilation to the outside, um, so that way I don't suffocate or hurt myself in any way with that. Would I recommend building a 3D printer for yourself? No. Generally, if you want to get started in 3D printing, I would not recommend building a printer. It's quite a task to get to get something like this built. And nowadays there are some pretty inexpensive printers out there. For instance, the one I would recommend to beginners, people who want to get into 3D printing is the Ender 3. I've heard a lot of good things about it. You can look it up on YouTube, tons of YouTube videos about it that'll give you an overview of it. It's, it's a very inexpensive printer. It's about 180 to 250 dollars, that kind of range, um, depending on where you get it from. And it can do a lot of a lot of stuff. So I would recommend that for most beginners. Now, would I recommend 3D printing for most people? No, because 3D printing in and of itself is a bit of a hobby. Um, if you if you have a 3D printer, you have to be ready to maintain it. You have to be ready to calibrate it. And so I'd say it's not something that's ready for like a general consumer use. If you're somebody who's into into tinkering with things and stuff like that, absolutely go ahead. You'll have to look things up on the internet and get instructions from there in order to troubleshoot it and stuff like that. So um, not recommended for for people who aren't you know, hobbyists, tinkerers, things like that to start with. Anyway, that's it for my overview of my 3D printer. If you have any more questions for me, go ahead, leave them down in the comments below. I will be answering as many questions as I can down there. Thank you very much for spending your time here, and I hope to see you guys in the next video. Bye. You've been a very good dog. Yes, you have. Oh, you're just so cute. Mwah. <laughs>